ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to apologize because my English is terrible. Uh, I don't speak English first because I am French. <laughs> and during a long time, the French uh, think that they don't need to speak another language. And the second reason uh, is my wife is Welsh. So, <laughs> and maybe I can tell you a, um, a little story. When I visit my wife family in Wales for the first time, I heard a, um, a conversation between my wife and one of his uh, brother. And uh, I think she, she was asking, uh, how do you... How, how do you find this guy? And the little brother say, he speaks English like a Pakistani. <laughs> <laughs> so once I told this story uh, during a conference in La Sorbonne with Tony Blair, and uh, my advisor told me, never say that you are going to have trouble with Pakistani people. So. <laughs> So uh, I want to, to talk to you about uh, a cause that uh, is there um, to me, that is uh, the cause of the Christian of the East. Uh, maybe you will tell me that uh, this is a cause that has been lost for a long time already, since uh, the numbers of the Christian of the East have collapsed almost everywhere in the Middle East, except uh, for Lebanon and Egypt. Uh, you will tell me that uh, it is a, a secondary cause when war has returned to Europe. You will tell me that the cause of the Christian of the East is only interest to Christian, and that is a, a religious uh, bias and not a strategic issue, and even less uh, an universal cause. I think uh, the opposite is true. I think that the, the disappearance of the Christian of the East enshrines the religious intolerance that leads to violence and war. This uh, religious intolerance does not only affect Christian. Uh, it opposes uh, Muslim against each other, uh, Sunnis uh, against Shiite, and even Shiite against uh, each other. And uh, this uh, religious intolerance fuels also the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When uh, states are defined only by their religion, discrimination against minorities becomes the rules. And the Middle East, uh, unfortunately, is heading straight in this direction. Sunni state, Shiite state, a Jewish state, this configuration makes peace impossible in this region. As the situation in Syria and Iraq, but also in Lebanon, in Turkey, in Armenia shows. The confrontation between uh, Sunni Saudi Arabia and Shiite Iran is largely responsible for the collapse of Lebanon, which was nevertheless a, a demonstration that Muslim and Christian religious community can live together. In short, uh, my message, and uh, I, 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 I hope this message is a message to the leader of the Middle East, is simple. Uh, respect minorities, all minorities, and you will find the path to peace and development. Exclude minorities, drive out the Christian of the East, and you will create the condition for a permanent disorder that will feed the cycle of violence and deprive your people of the security and prosperity uh, to which they are entitled. In addition, the, the permanence of the crisis in the Middle East can only reinforce the economic domination of Asia and weaken Europe because of its geographical uh, proximity, but also because the message of decline and weakness we send out by displaying its powerlessness to defend the modest Christian community of the East, from which it nevertheless draws its roots. For Europe has uh, seriously failed in its historic role as protector of the Christian of the East. 
beyond the speeches and chatty donors' uh, conference, Europe has never made this cause a real priority. Uh, in Iraq, where the US-led war has claimed more than 500,000 victims, the situation of Eastern Christians has never been so difficult. Their numbers have fallen by almost 90%, and only a few non-governmental organizations are trying to ensure the survival of those who remain. This war has also provided the Islamic totalitarian with the arguments that allow them to enlist a part of the Muslim in their holy war, which is uh, only a political attempt to take power and establish a totalitarian regime that had nothing to envy to Nazism or Stalinism. The result is overwhelming. Iraq has been destroyed physically and morally. The installation of the Shiites in power has opened the doors of the country to his old Persian rival, uh, who did not ask for so much. In Syria, the Christians were faced with an impossible choice between Bashar al-Assad and the mortal threat to them posed by the accession to power of the Sunni community. The blindness of the West in seeing the civil war as a struggle of the Syrian people for democracy and human rights, when it was more a death struggle between Shiite and Sunni for control of the country, has serious consequences. The Ba'ath regime held on to power in a bloodbath that left uh, half a million people dead. If we add uh, Syria and Iraq, is one million uh, people dead in this area this last year. Russia has considerably strengthened its influence in the Middle East, and Iran, after Iraq and Lebanon, has become a major player in Syria. Europe has almost disappeared from the Syrian landscape today. In Egypt, the rise of Salafism poses a serious threat to uh, the Christian community, who, which represents 10% of the country population. Here again, the West uh, has shown a, a distressing amateurism and blindness by supporting a, a revolution that was an attempt to seize power by the Muslim Brothers that ended with the replacement of a general, Mubarak, by a Maréchal, Sisi. The Copts have seen no difference in the discriminatory treatment they receive. Their fundamental rights are regularly flouted. Their religious freedom is constantly challenged when their lives are not taken away, as shown by the long list of attacks against their community. In the Middle East, in Armenia, the violence of Muslim Azerbaijan is unleashed once again against a people whose only thought is to be Christian. Here again, Europe uh, looks away, absorbed by the conflict in Ukraine, which is no more or less vital to our long-term interests. So the question I want to to, to, to pose is what is the curse that strikes the Christian of the East so that their fate is so indifferent to the international community? What thoughts have these men and women whose religion, culture, and civilization are the foundation of the West committed that we should allow them to be massacred, driven from their native land, and discriminated against in silence. I see several reasons for this uh, abandonment. The first one is the bad conscience of Westerners who had allowed themselves to be trapped in an absurd historical guilt toward Muslim. I say absurd because the West does not have the exclusive right to colonization or slavery. The second reason is the vital need to, for our developed uh, economy to have access to the energy resource of the Middle East. 
The third reason is uh, the moral obligation to support the state of Israel after the Hymans and unspeakable crime committed against uh, the Jewish people. More recently, the incomprehension of a growing number of Europeans with no religious belief about the persistence of a confrontation that they were wrongly considered to be uh, from another age. And finally, the lack of historical culture that makes uh, many commentators and even leaders believe that the creation of the East are the remains of colonization, descendant of crusaders, immigrant to the East that Muslims are entitled to reject. This is uh, obviously forgetting that the creation of Mosul, Jerusalem, Antioch, or Damascus have been there for two millennia, well before the establishment in the seventh century of a Muslim power on the ruins of the Roman Empire. You must have met the, the men and women who pray in the churches of uh, Karakosh or Sahle to understand that they are the direct descendant of the first question, that they preceded us by several centuries in the affirmation of a faith that will change the world. These men and women pose no political threat today to the powers that uh, be in this country. They are small numbers, and um, the habit of persecution have led them to melt into a kind of political anonymity to live humbly in their homeland, which uh, threaten to reject them at any moment. The fight for the survival of this community is, in my opinion, much more fundamental for Europe than the war in Ukraine, because it concerns our origin, the basis of our culture, and our credibility in the Middle East. In 2015, during a, a visit to Iran, I met the former president of the Islamic Republic, uh, the Ayatollah Khafsanjani. And during our uh, conversation, he said to me about Israel, Sir, the Jews must leave. They have nothing to do in Palestine. When I told him that uh, he could not say that, he replied, give me one good reason um, for what they, they should stay in Palestine. I told him that they were there 2,000 years ago. He laughed and he said, uh, we were in India two and a half uh, thousand years ago. We are not going back there. So honestly, I was not expecting this answer and I was tuned for a few moments. Then I said to him, uh, maybe without to think. Uh, OK, continue like this. Kick the Jews out of the Middle East. Kick the Christian out. And you don't think that tomorrow the European will want to kick the Muslim out of Europe. And this uh, brutal and simplistic uh, answer sum up the risks that Europe and the Middle East are running in the face of this rise of in intolerance and sectarianism that the defeat of the Islamic State in Iraq uh, had, has not, not, not reduced. The threat that um, I call, and you make the reference to my book, Islamic totalitarianism, I prefer this uh, uh, way to, to call this movement because most of the people speak about Islamic terrorism, but terrorism is just a way to act. Uh, the, the, why to, to talk about Islamic totalitarianism? Because we are in presence of an ideology like those that spread death and chaos in the 20th century. Islamic totalitarianism is a political movement that dresses itself up in the garb of religion to impose a totalitarian regime in which uh, Sharia takes the place of laws and the constitution wherever Muslim live. This movement is active from Far East to West Africa. It's a controlled part of Pakistan 
and the whole of, of Afghanistan since uh, the pitiful departure of the American and their allies. It is active in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Libya, in the Sahel, which uh, French forces have had to partially abandon, in Nigeria, and even in Senegal. It is gaining ground in Europe, where Islamist uh, hotbeds are often protected by an Iranic vision of the defense of human rights. This is the case in France, where far-left organizations defend Islamists in the name of an ideological fight against Islamophobia. This attitude contributes to the rise of antisemitism, which is confused with criticism of Israel on the Palestinian question. Today, there are real uh, enclaves on European soil where this totalitarian ideology prospers with impunity. What does uh, this have to do with uh, Eastern Christian, you may ask? Islamic totalitarianism is dangerous because the Middle East is unstable and inflammable. Uh, it is in uh, Iran, in Iraq, in Syria, or Libya, that this totalitarian movement have their bases, their thinkers, their strategists, and that they recruit the cadre of their combat unit. Some Gulf countries and Iran finance them, either by ideology or by fear of being swept away by this uh, torrent of sectarianism and violence. The instability of the Middle East is penalizing its economic development and keeping a huge part of its population in misery. The million of Syrian, Iraqi, and Palestinian refugees constitute a, a fertile ground for the development of this totalitarian movement. There is no hope of reducing this threat if Middle East is under fire. It's the reason for what Europe must therefore make peace in the Middle East a priority. In order to achieve this, it must ensure the protection of discriminated minorities, first and foremost the Christian of the East. If uh, all minorities in Middle East have a protector, this is not the case for Christian. Indeed, the Jews uh, have the United States. The Palestinians are supported uh, more or less by the Arab countries, the Shiite minorities by Iran, and the Sunni minorities by Saudi Arabia. The question of the East should be defended by Europe, which only pays lip service to this. The question of the East should be defended by the Vatican, which does so only with infinite precaution, so as not to offend the sensibility of a Muslim world that does not appreciate it. Certainly, there is a uh, reason to hope. First, uh, the Abraham Agreement seems to consecrate a positive evolution of the Persian Gulf state, which by engaging uh, in a peace process with Israel, initiative, uh, uh, initiate a very profound change in the geostrategic balance in the Middle East. But these agreements may also provide the Islamists with additional argument to fuel their jihad if the Palestinian question is not answered. If Lebanon falls into the hand of Hezbollah, and Iraq and Syria continue their descent to, uh, into hell. Europe, whose uh, imagination is limitless when it comes to inventing sanctions against Russia, is incapable of countering the disastrous evolution of the Middle Eastern states toward a communitarian, sectarian, and exclusive withdrawal. In the 20th century, religious states with varying degrees of intensity have swept away all attempts from uh, Atatürk to Nasser to secularize, to, to secularize the state and ensure its neutrality toward the various faiths. Islam seems to have totally abandoned the modernizing path proposed by Mohammed Abdu, the great uh, 19th century theologian, who insisted on the existence of free will and preached interreligious uh, friendship. And yet, in the depths of this society, 
there is a thirst for life, a thirst for friendship, and among the scholars and theologians, there are men of concord. We do not divide the communities and religion of the book. Ecumenism is one of the paths to peace and reconciliation. Faith is not the adversary of peace. It's an intransigent and uh, politicized faith, uh, which is. Peace in the Middle East can only be built on respect for differences, on tolerance, on religious freedom, on freedom of conscience. The, the fragile presence of Christian community, whose origins go back to the dawn of time, is one of the key of this piece, for this, to this piece. Like uh, that all other minorities who must be able to access uh, the same civil rights, uh, the same security for their family as members of the majority community. Christians uh, has, have long lived in peace in Syria and Iraq. Uh, have they ever been a threat to other religion or to the power that be? Never. Why are they being attacked today? Because they are the scapegoats of a radicalization of Islam, instrumentalized by those who want to impose by force, by violence, a political regime that has nothing to do with religion, but everything to do with the conquest of power and the quenching of the, world, uh, of the worst human instinct. You, maybe you will tell me that Europeans do not have lesson uh, in tolerance to give. They who invented religious war, burned heretics in public places, and perpetrated uh, with the Shoah the greatest genocide in history. But I think we have learned, or I hope we have learned from our mistakes. We have paid the price for our fault. We are all nation tired of trying to order the world. We have acquired a wisdom, or at least a, a realism, which should allow us today to propose a path other than that of the clash of civilization, another path also that of the competition for world domination proposed by uh, our friend uh, American and China. This path goes through the Middle East because it, it is the cradle of uh, our civilization, because it is our historical responsibility, because we are united by Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, because it is on our doorstep and no wall will protect us from the dramas of Middle East. The cause of the Christian of the East is therefore a strategic and universal cause that challenges Europe and places it before its most fundamental responsibility. What should Europeans do to meet this existential challenge? First, they should clearly affirm their support and solidarity with these discriminated minorities. Secondly, make their relation with the Middle Eastern states, their trade, diplomatic, and cooperation policies conditional on respect for the fundamental right of this community. I have never been uh, convinced of the effectiveness of sanction. I do not believe that the sanction decided against Russia can bring to its knees a country that neither Napoleon nor Hitler could bring to its knees. But the choice made to implement them underlines our passivity regarding states that participate in the elimination of Eastern Christians. A policy of sanction is therefore necessary to ensure the protection of the last Christian in the East. And finally, if this strategy is not enough to stop their elimination, we have the duty to welcome them in Europe. What message are we sending when we refuse them access to our territory? When we welcome millions of Africans, we are flying misery, but we are not rejected from, from their native land for their face, like the children of the plain of Nineveh. In the end, 
The question of the question of the East is a symbolic question for the future of Europe. If we choose to look away and abandon them to their fate, to their eradication from their native land, we are choosing our own decline. We send the world a message of our weakness. We are allowing a sectarian Islam to flourish, leading the Middle East into a dead end. We accept the emergence of more and more states characterized by their religion to the detriment of all the values embodied by Europe since the Enlightenment. Behind the fight for the Christian of the East lies the fight for respect for all others, uh, respect for religious minorities, but also respect for intellectuals who do not forget Averroes, respect uh, for women who dream of equality, respect for Muslims who want to free themselves from religious conflict, respect for men of faith who believe in the richness of Economica, economical dialogue. Taking the side of uh, diversity is thus taking the side of all those who aspire to a more tolerant and uh, a more open society. And the day this society uh, awakens, the spectra of the clash of civilization will disappear and the new beginning uh, between East and West uh, will be uh, announced. So it's a dream, says a sceptic. No, it's not a dream, it's a, a project. It is a project of good men who know that against fanatism, the sword can defend us, but it is a revolution of mind and earth that will make peace. Thank you. Back in the end of uh, 2002, uh, Bishop Ria Abu al Asal, the, the Anglican Bishop of Jerusalem, uh, was talking to Tony Blair in, the, in, in Jerusalem. And Tony Blair was trying to persuade him to support the, the invasion of Iraq. And uh, Bishop Ria told him that if, if we did invade Iraq, then it would be the end of Christianity in the Middle East, because it would be like a new crusade. It would be seen as a new crusade. Um, I just wondered whether uh, your thoughts on, on this issue. I'm going to answer by uh, another uh, story. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, but I was with uh, President Chirac uh, when uh, <coughs> George W. Bush called him to convince him to support the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, war in Iraq. And uh, President Bush said to Chirac, Jacques, we are going to bring democracy to Iraq. And Chirac said, uh, George, I am going to explain to you what will be democracy in Iraq. It will be the Senate against the Shiites. And I look at uh, George W. Bush and I'm not sure. I have been in USA last week attending International Religious Freedom Summit and in Cambridge yesterday to attend some conference. And I have noticed that the Christian persecution, a silent Christian persecution is also continuing in Europe and nobody is ready to speak about it. So it's See, it seems to me another kind of death of Christianity as you are mentioning, not Christianity, Christians, as you are mentioning in East Asia, so in, in the East of the Asian countries. So how, how these people or these governments or these establishments can be, be motivated to do something for the equal rights of the Christianity and raising the voice for the Christianophobia as it is equally being raised about Islamophobia. Thank you. Je suis pas sûr d'avoir tout à fait compris la question. Or could you maybe summarize it just in a, in a, in a brief sentence so it's easier? Oh, I, I would like to ask the question how the European governments can be instigated or can be convinced to work to stop Christianophobia as well as in the presence of the Islamophobia. 
Is it? Yeah, because the, the, the two uh, phenomena are uh, tied. More, more uh, you will have uh, the, 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 the European people um, um, think that uh, uh, the Christians are um, throughout the uh, Middle East more this fuels uh, the, their judgment about Islam. It's, a, it's, it's wrong, but it's a reality. I think the, the only way is to go toward uh, like countries. Uh, I know that it's very difficult to say to a lot of Muslim people, but uh, it, it's why I, I try to, to demonstrate. Uh, we need uh, the danger for, for, for the future is this uh, religious country. Because when you, you, you say my country is a, a Sunni country or is a, a Shiite country or is a Jewish country, you exclude the other. Even if the people have the same rights, but you exclude them. So it's very important to, 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 to try and I know that the, 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 the way, it, it will be a long way to uh, 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 more uh, um, like countries, like government, uh, to, 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 to protect all the religion and all the communities. Uh, and uh, Europe has a responsibility because if we uh, have a, a, a and if you, you say an um, Islamophobia speech or way of uh, thinking, uh, we fuel also the reaction in, in the other countries. Professor Kukre, thank you, Dave. You have uh, very convincingly demonstrated to us also some of the self-defeating policies of the Western countries in the uh, Muslim world where Christian minorities live. And I think one should not be surprised if uh, one creates a political vacuum as a result of regime change, whether in Iraq or the one which was also attempted in, in uh, Syria and which occurred in uh, Libya. One should not be surprised that this vacuum will quickly be filled by religion. And I to, and in this case, the majority religion, of course. And I do remember the times in the secular era in Iraq with Tariq Aziz as foreign minister, Michel Aflac uh, as the um, um, symbolic head of the party and so on. All of this has been destroyed effectively because of uh, Western intervention. And uh, my uh, specific uh, question would be, in view of uh, what we tried in our organization in the 1970s and 1980s, could it not help now also to, uh, for if the Christian side would engage directly in conversations, dialogue on even issues, delicate, different, difficult issues of theology? And just to recall, in 1981, I did organize a symposium about monotheism in Wahdaniya or Tawhid in Islam and Christianity. And uh, we did that in coordination with the Vatican. And uh, it was held in Rome and with the organization of the Islamic Conference in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. It was a very productive meeting in a friendly atmosphere, uh, by the way, under the patronage of the Crown Prince of Jordan, and attended by Muslims, Muslim and Christian scholars. And it was possible to agree on certain basic elements of the nature of a monotheistic faith. And I also recall at a conference in Tehran which was about the situation of the Muslims in Europe, in Bosnia. Uh, President Rafsanjani, to whom you referred, in his speech to the delegates, specifically referred to certain basic theological teachings, and he emphasized the special 
role in Islamic theology of Holy Mary, just to give an example, and tried to somehow build a foundation for a meaningful dialogue. Should one not encourage that? And just last, a very recent experience, very sad one in Austria, at the initiative of late King Abdallah of Saudi Arabia, Vienna hosted a huge uh, intergovernmental organization which was called King Abdallah Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue. And the member states were Saudi Arabia, Austria, Spain, plus the Holy See, the Vatican, as an observer. And they had uh, a beautiful palace in Vienna where the flags of these four entities, the three states, plus the flag of the Holy See of the Vatican, were uh, hoisted permanently. Unfortunately, and, and that, in, that center did uh, engage in many important international conferences and activities, and somehow uh, it was the wish of uh, King Abdallah that this should be in Vienna, and he wanted to make a point, which maybe he could not make with a center in, in Cheddar or in Riyadh. And uh, unfortunately, more or less, this initiative has been ruined because uh, domestic politics in Austria led to uh, uh, very uh, hostile media campaigns and civil society campa campaigns against the center because of Saudi Arabian policies and so on. Also, the center itself was uh, not... Uh, it was an intergovernmental organization by state treaty. And now, as I see, because I, I live nearby, all the flags have been removed from the building. The only flag that remains is that of Saudi Arabia. So my question is to you also in, in view of your experience as a politician, are uh, such uh, 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 developments in terms also of your own politics not uh, absolutely uh, counterproductive and, so to speak, defeating the European interest in uh, preserving the rights of the Christians in the Muslim world? Do they not destroy the credibility? On the one hand, if one intervenes militarily and effectively des destroys the country, how should there be any confidence? in the majority religion of those countries. And on the other side, as far as uh, tiny Austria is concerned, if one initially sponsors such a center together with the Muslims at their initiative and then destroys it, or uh, if the government somehow out of opportunism because of these chauvinist maybe right-wing tendencies, out of opportunism more or less abandons it, I mean, that creates very negative feelings, and uh, it is uh, really hard to build anything positive on, on, on that. So th these are my questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I am, I think, just make, making some comment more than answer to your question. Uh, first, you mentioned uh, Jordania. Uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, there is some um, country in the Middle East who are uh, um, who, have, uh, who are open to the Christian, and Jordan is one of them. Uh, um, the the um, United Arab Emirates, there is the Christian have uh, are free to, to to pray. They have church. They have an organization. Saudi Arabia, it's not, it's not the case at this time. Maybe it's going to, to, to improve, but it's not the case. In, in Qatar, it's not the case. Uh, um, in fact, there is very few parts of the Middle East where the Christians are completely free to, to uh, uh, believe. Uh, second comment, mm. um, to have this um, dialogue between the religion, we need uh, um, clever and <laughs> moderate religious <laughs> people who are able to to speak uh, with us. Uh, I have a, a very bad uh, experience. You, you are going to tell me that there is no 
it's a completely different matter, but um, when I was Prime Minister, at the end of the, the, the mandate of uh, Sarkozy, w just before the presidential election, we had a very, very tough and very difficult debate about uh, um, the abattage ritual. Uh, um, uh, retail slaughter. Retail uh, and it was it was a b it was a very bad uh, uh, debate between the e extreme right and and I was uh, a, a journalist asked me a question in, in morning in, in a radio and phew, I have no <laughs> no I didn't want to answer to this question so I say uh, something I don't think you know something from my <laughs> I say maybe it will be time for religion to modernize their uh, beliefs and their way of uh, I, I I just wanted to to say that uh, these uh, rules about uh, um, 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 slaughter about uh, are rules coming from uh, a long history for for very very uh, uh, practical reason. So I uh, create a, a, a real storm against me, and the 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 most aggressive were the Christian, the the the, the president of the French bishop uh, conference. Uh, Say uh, what the prime minister is. Uh, um, he had nothing to 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 say about religion. It's not his. Uh, the Jews were very very angry against me. In fact, the Muslim were the most moderate. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember uh, two years after that, I was flying from uh, from Vienna to Paris, and in a plane coming from. Uh, Tel Aviv. And when I came in the plane, the people w uh, um, were aggressive because of this uh, story. So I, I want just to tell you that to organize the dialogue between religion, we need people who are, uh, and it's not, it's not easy. The third comment I want to make, it's about uh, the, the question of the military uh, intervention of uh, uh, the Western forces in in the world. I think we we this time is finished. Um, if you look at the military intervention of the West um, for the, the the last twenty years, all were uh, all failed. And it's not a question of military power because we have military power. It's more complicated i think it's it's impossible to 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 force a people to make a path uh, without to 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 do the the, the step to this uh, to this path uh, vietnam uh, iraq uh, or you can the, the list is is long afghanistan and uh, when um, we intervened uh, the French in Libya or in Sahel. I, I try to explain that to the, the people in, in, in charge, that from my view, it's more and more difficult to do this sort of military intervention. And when I saw what is uh, happening to uh, the Russian army in Afghanistan, in, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> not in Afghanistan, but in Ukraine, I think the same thing will happen to, 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 to it's not only the, 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 the West, is, is a question of military power. It's not possible at this now, I think, to, to, to impose by force uh, uh, a regime or uh, uh, to, 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 a, to a country. Uh, with uh, it's a question of, uh, of uh, information, of uh, um, uh, social m network of uh, education. 
It's not an answer to your question, but it's a more comment. So we, ha we have to try to find another way to, 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 comment to, to convince this country to change. And it's not the military way with uh, the good one. Professor Diab, and then we'll go back to the audience. Please. Okay, so um, you're, you're, you're not going to ask questions, you have to answer. I'm not going to ask questions. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm from Lebanon. As you all know, Lebanon is uh, very unique and uh, a very unique country, very unique in so many ways uh, with respect to its, to its uh, social mosaic, whether uh, it has to do with the religious or sectarian makeup or ethnic makeup or uh, history or even at the economic and social levels and so on. And uh, I don't know if you recall, uh, I'm sure you do, when Pope John uh, II uh, visited a uh, few decades ago uh, Lebanon, he said that uh, Lebanon is uh, more than a country. It is a message. And indeed, it is a message to the world in the sense that if this model works in Lebanon, then there is hope for the rest of the world. Um, uh, I have to be critical, uh, although I'm uh, very much pro-West and uh, my whole education from K to 12 up to PhD and my professional career was all in Western American or British uh, organizations. Uh, I have to be a bit critical of some of the Western countries uh, uh, you know, from an academic discussion, academic point of view. So when we talk, for example, about uh, uh, the war in Iraq or, uh, let's say, the uh, Islamic extremism, um, it's interesting because, uh, I mean, uh, Islam is not about extremism, it's about inclusion, accepting the other, and it has been attested uh, in the media by uh, uh, politicians, uh, whether in North America or in Europe, that uh, uh, ISIS and all of this extremism, Islamic extremism movements, were the manufacturing of uh, countries outside the region. In fact, uh, uh, the most highest percentage of people killed or uh, were Islam, uh, were Muslims in in the in you know, as a result of these uh, extremist movement. Uh, nobody, no true Muslim believes in, in these uh, uh, movements. Um, so uh, uh, it's important uh, to keep in mind that uh, some Western politicians, without naming them, they have clearly attested in the media that it is the manufacturing of some of these countries, it was the policy of some of these countries to create these, uh, these uh, movements. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, even what happened in Iraq, uh, uh, the British Prime Minister came up and said it was a mistake, you know, after a million Iraqis were killed as a result. So there are mistakes being uh, made by some uh, Western uh, policies uh, in the region that at the minimum should be learning lessons for the future. Um, and. Uh, 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 I think uh, uh, most, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, MENA region or Arab countries want inclusion, want to be open, want to be humanitarian, want to, I mean, uh, as a Lebanese, I'm a Muslim myself, but uh, 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 what uh, the speaker was talking about uh, in terms of uh, Eastern Christians, I feel more threatened as a, as a Muslim in Lebanon if uh, the Christians would leave Lebanon. Uh, I, I feel more at safe uh, to, to uh, have them uh, included as part of the policy making, as, part the, as being partners in, in, in our uh, country, in the decision making of our country, regardless of what their percentage in the population they represent. Um, so I think uh, um, many think, many um, uh, Middle Eastern people think the same way I, as, as I do uh, in, in that uh, respect. But uh, sometimes, uh, um, you know, of course, there are many mistakes uh, carried out by the, um, by the, you know, Arab leaders, but at the same time, there are mistakes uh, that are uh, carried out by some 
uh, Western uh, uh, politicians. Uh, so you talked about the Palestinian problem. I mean, um, I don't know if you want to go back to history and talk about uh, who was where for 100 years, then uh, there would be hundreds of claims all over. Uh, Spain would probably go back to, I don't know, which Islamic country or uh, and so India, you mentioned India and so on. So the, the only solution I see for this uh, um, 70 year old, over 70 year old uh, problem is uh, very simply uh, acceptance of each other, it's a two state solution. And when King Abdullah came to Beirut, uh, if you remember, it was called the King Abdullah Accord back in 2000, I think. Um, uh, he simply said that, you know, the 22 Arab countries were willing to sign a peace treaty for a two state solution. It was not even uh, entertained for discussion at the time. So uh, 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 I think, uh, you know, I, I personally lived through, uh, unfortunately, many wars in the region because I insist and persist to stay living in, in my country, in Lebanon. Um, and uh, I think if uh, any war should be waged uh, in the future, it should be against poverty, it should be against uh, inequality, lack of education, against corruption. And there's a lot of corruption uh, all around, um, and uh, if um, friends want to help the region, they should help them in that respect. And uh, I think uh, many politicians in the Middle East and in the West will understand from this sentence what I mean. Thank you. Can just I, I uh, testimony about. Uh, uh, Lebanon was uh, the, the proof that it's, it, it will be possible to have this community living together. Because Lebanon was uh, destabilized by Palestinian uh, 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 exile, and after that by the fight again between Iran and Saudi Arabia. But the people in uh, uh, Lebanon are used to live together. And I have a, a, a story, uh, I, I don't remember when it was, but it was in the 80s, uh, when the city of Jezin was uh, surrounded, surrounded yeah. by... Uh, Israelis at the time. Yes, yeah. and, and Israeli, and there was... Also 83, I think, yeah. And uh, Chirac uh, asked me to, to go to Jezin to... To, to, to support. Uh, you were his kamikaze, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I traveled to Lebanon by boat. Uh, I spent some time with the Christian, but the Christian were not able to 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 escort me to to Jezin because it was uh, it was surrounded. And I went to the uh, uh, Muslim side, and uh, the president of the um, Lebanese Parliament. Uh, give me uh, an escort with his son and Husseini. with Hussein 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 Hussein. Hussein. and with his escort I travel to Jezin and when I arrive uh, at the door of Jezin uh, I became the escort of my escort because they are they were Muslim and we were we were received together with uh, I, I had about 40 gunmen with me with uh, Kalashnikov and uh, and other weapons. And uh, the mayor of Jezin organized uh, a lunch, uh, a huge lunch, because the Lebanese like uh, to eat. Like the French. <laughs> <laughs> and during about two hours, the Christian surrounded and the Muslim <laughs> were speaking together as very good friends, speaking about the, the past. So it's, 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 it's an anecdote, but it's uh, showing that it's absolutely possible to have this uh, cohabitation of uh, communities. And Lebanon was, uh, is, the example of that, but uh, a straightened example. Thank you very much. We have three questions from the audience. Let's start first with our advisory board member, Mr. Mohammed Atmar, former foreign minister of Afghanistan. If we could please bring a microphone to Mr. Atmar. And then we'll come to you. I'm sorry, you've been <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, Your Excellency, thank you so much for this enlightening uh, uh, speech and lecture, and I am so grateful to also Excellency supporting uh, that process. Um, I uh, have one humble suggestion and then comment and one question. Um, the humble suggestion is pretty much in line to what His Excellency the Prime Minister said. Perhaps uh, in your extremely well-argued case, we can remove the word Islamic from totalitarianism. <laughs> I know so. uh, yeah. Because the totalitarian um, the regimes, forces, they do not necessarily represent Islam. They do not necessarily believe in true values of Islam, just as was uh, argued. Um, Perhaps the only reason why the Islamic uh, adjective is there for that to uh, totalitarianism is that apparently they claim that they are Muslim. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but whether they represent true Islam, that's a totally different question. I mean, the Taliban are being questioned whether they are true Muslims. Al-Qaeda is questioned whether they are true Muslims. Because as the Prime Minister said, their foremost and biggest victims are actually Muslims. So uh, the totalitarianism represented by them is primarily driven by self-interest, by maybe economic, political, you name it. So um, similarly, perhaps one thing ca could be put to our friends in the West that democracy at home, but totalitarianism in foreign policy. Because the belief in their self-interest is so strong that does not give any space for others to participate in uh, fair international <coughs> relations. So perhaps uh, a, a, a government of totalitarianists in the East and totalitarian foreign policies of the West can be both challenged and say, and at times they come together, as was the case uh, made, uh, that totalitarian <coughs> pursuit of interests sometimes allows them to work with totalitarian regimes in, in, in the East. Uh, so that's the suggestion part. The uh, question, um, very much, uh, uh, agree with you, Your Excellency, on the notion, the, the idea, the vision of cooperation of civilizations rather than a clash of civilizations. Um, uh, kicking the Christians, the Hindus, the Palestinians out of their homes uh, is not the answer, or uh, Muslims from Europe. Uh, the answer is in cooperation between them. But then the question is, how can we put the bright minds of state uh, leaders, such as your good self, to this question as to what is the best way forward on cooperation of civilization? Is it, again, common interests? Can common interests between Europe, the Middle East, and South Asia be the basis for cooperation of civilization? Uh, and if so, is there a hope that we can, in our generation, we can see such cooperation uh, fundamentally different from, from the practice that we have now? Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, first, I, I, I understand your comment about uh, totalitarianism, uh, Islamic totalitarianism. And it's not the first time somebody asks me about that. You're right, but in the same time, these people claim that they are uh, acting uh, on behalf of uh, God and, and Islam. So it's difficult to, we, we need just to characterize this sort of totalitarianism. But I understand what you, what you say. Um, um, on, on, the, on your question, my, my belief is um, 
the key of the, this um, the evolution of the situation is th the West have to understand that the West is no more leading the world. It's very important because we act as if we were exactly in the same position than uh, uh, 40 years ago. Uh, it's not the reality. We are, we are strong, we are developed country, we, are, we have a I think uh, um, showing the the, the way uh, on human rights and democracy, but we are not so powerful than uh, 40 years ago. And uh, f for example, when uh, we say today that uh, uh, the international community is uh, uh, um, uh, united. Uh, about the question of uh, the Russian invasion in, in Ukraine. It's not true. It's not true. There is uh, more people living in countries who are not concerned by this question than people living in the country who are engaged in, um, uh, on, on the side of the Ukrainian people. It's not, a, I, I, I'm not judging, I'm just saying that if we continue to think as if we were uh, leading the world alone, we are not going to find solution to, to the, the problem. Um, I was trying to explain to a friend some, some weeks ago that uh, the Russian economy is uh, reorganizing itself uh, with China, everybody says that, but nobody say with India. And it's more important, I think, uh, because a, a lot of uh, uh, economic cooperation today bet between uh, um, Russia and India explain why Russia is in a not too bad economic situation. And I was, I, I, I say that to a, a French politician, and it was an old one, and <laughs> he was a little bit provocative, and he say, uh, India, it's coolies. It's a so stupid answer. India, it's uh, the, the most, uh, uh, um, come on, popular, it's, it's the, 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 the biggest country in the world in terms of population. And I, yesterday I sent to this politician a, a, a short message. I say the coolies just bought 250 planes from Airbus yesterday. This is, a, this is a, the most important uh, uh, command, 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 order, order uh, I think since uh, years and years from uh, uh, one Indian company, 250 planes. So it's not, uh, it, it, I just say that to explain that if we want to be efficient in finding solution to the world problem, we have just to understand that we are, we are powerful, we are, great nation with a, um, um, a huge uh, history and but we are not s the leading the world and we have to for example I, I I think if we have been able at the beginning of the war between Russia and Ukraine to convince the Chinese to come with us to try to stop this war maybe we will succeed you, you remember what we do when I say what we do, what the Americans do. They, tr they straighten the Chinese. Say, if you help uh, Russia, we are going to sanction you. It's the best, it's the, the worst way to speak to, to, to a country like China. It's, it's not, uh, um, and, and well, I, it, for me, it's very important to, to, to try to, to understand that th there is a new equilibrium in the world. And we have to, even if we don't like uh, the Chinese regime, we don't like the, we have to, tr to, 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 they are, they are here, they are in, in the, and, and, and we have to, 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 
to change our way of thinking the future of the world. Thank you very much. Maria, if you could come to the front, the microphone is here, and the gentleman there has been waiting patiently, so he's next, and then we'll come to the front. The gentleman there, please. Please introduce, introduce yourself as well. Yeah, uh, my name is Christian Hausmann. I'm from the Universal Peace Federation. Thank you very much for all what you said so far. I think it was in 2005 on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the United Nations when Kofi Annan then asked generally the question, how can the UN be more effective in securing and guaranteeing peace? He was very self-critical at that point, 60 years and now yeah. So, um, he asked this question and the founder of our organization at that point said, well, maybe to create something like a second chamber to the UN or an inter-religious council would be helpful, drawing from the wisdom of all the world religions uh, could, and speaking with one voice, could be a way to raise uh, awareness that these problems that you all described will not appear. And given the fact that any true religion is concerned not only uh, about the, uh, their own followers, but about all humankind, and given the fact that um, uh, maybe 80% of the religious contents is the same, concerning the view of man living for the sake of others and so, uh, such a, uh, I want to hear what you think about the formation of such an inter-religious council. Problem would be to find people scholars or representatives that are reasonable, that are moderate, that deeply understand the religion and uh, that it is uh, something to benefit all humankind. But uh, I, I still hope that this influence could be bigger than the influence of a politician that is easily marked to be the, the interest of some country or some... some uh, I would like to hear what you think about the uh, religious council that speaks uh, and draws from the wisdom of the religious traditions and speaks for peace. Thank you. No, the inter-religion uh, um, cooperation or uh, research and are very important. The problem is to find the, the right guy to, to speak. and. Uh, and the, the, the different religions have different organizations. So the Christians have a, a, a very um, um, dit, uh, vertical organization. So you, you have, uh, it's, it's more different with the Muslim. But in the same time, the vertical organization of the Christian is not working very well. <laughs> so, uh, but you, what you say about uh, United Nations is very important because I, I, I am in favor since a long time of a, a, a deep reform of uh, um, United Nations. And uh, especially I think we, we need to reform the Security Council. Uh, and we need to um, 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 enlarge the Security Council with a, a strong country like Germany, uh, but also uh, from um, uh, Muslim, um, Middle East, from Africa, from South America. Uh, we cannot. It's the same question that the, what, what I tried to say five minutes ago about the idea that the West is the, the master of the world and the situation is the same than 40 years ago. No, it's not the same. So we need to understand that uh, uh, there will be more than one billion people living in Africa. Uh, Africa have the strongest role to play in uh, the United Nations. Uh, I am not in favor of a European uh, um, seat on the Security Council. <laughs> I am in favor of a German seat <laughs> and a French seat. <laughs> because I think at the end, even with the best uh, European cooperation, uh, we have vital interests. And those vital interests are those of the nation. So it's not for me acceptable to imagine that France gives a, the, the, the seat to the um, Security Council to the European com co community. But I think Germany had to, to go, Japan had to go to, had to, 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 go to the... 
Mr. Fiona, if you agree, we have seven more well, minutes. I'm sorry because I, 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 my English is so poor. It's perfect. I, it's perfect. I, am, I am suffering for you. You are, you are too humble. No, it's going perfectly. But I would love to take three more questions. There's a gentleman in the back who's been waiting very patiently. Uh, I'd ask you all to please be very brief so that there's enough room for everything. Then the, the young lady in the, in the front and then uh, Professor Diap. And then so let's take those together, if it's okay, Mr. Fio, and then you can respond as a, as a final response. Please. Uh, okay, I want to go back to the, uh, this religious extremism issue. Uh, let me start with the story. Oh, you have to turn the microphone on. Uh, a few years ago, very there brief, was... Okay. Do you hear me? Okay. okay. A few years ago, uh, there was a program on an Iraqi TV. Uh, there was a girl uh, who was... Uh, captivated by ISIS, then he, uh, she managed to escape them. She was raped, definitely. She uh, managed to escape them and come to Germany. The ISIS member followed her to Germany. That girl was not protected here. She went back to Iraq. The, ma the man was insisting she should marry her. That's interesting. That happened in Germany. She went back to Iraq. The man followed him, her back to Iraq, and finally the Iraqi police arrested that man. This was a uh, direct confrontation uh, on TV. And uh, when the ISIS attacked Syria, thousands of members came and joined ISIS from Europe. Those who, many of those who beheaded people, who decapitated people, were holding European passports. Now, there is a big question in the Middle East. What's going on really in Europe? What's the red lines of freedom in Europe? How is it possible for Europe to harbor such people that can easily be hit people? The same people you have right now, you have thousands of such people among people of your society of the same ideology who attacked Charlie Hebdo. So don't you think there should be a kind of red line, a kind of uh, new borders? Shouldn't you uh, redraw your borders of freedom in, this, in Europe? There are so many Islamic centers, and you know very well what they are doing. P please conclude. Yes, this is the question. In the name of freedom, these people, uh, these people, this uh, especially Islamic extremism, is abusing the democratic freedom in Europe. The, uh, so, uh, don't you think you should kind of draw new red lines for these groups for your freedom? I don't know, freedom of thought, freedom of association, and so on. Thank you very much. Maria, if you could please take the microphone. I want to try again. Everyone, if you could please be brief. Uh, one more comment or question in the front, and then one brief comment question, Professor Diab. Yes, thank you. Um, do you believe uh, that religion is becoming irrelevant to those common European values, traditions, and roots that established the European community? And while we are today integrating refugees and migrants, of other religious background. Uh, do you believe that it is respect to their religious difference or respect to the common European values and way of life that should weigh more? Thank you, Thank you very much. And Professor Diab, and then a concluding remark, please, uh, well, from uh, Mr. Um, I think what the, I'm going to go back to what the gentleman uh, was mentioning a minute ago because he hit the he hit the issue on the nail and what the lady just uh, mentioned. I think the, the crisis that the world is facing today is a crisis of values. Um, and uh, the values that uh, all religions speak about. I think uh, all religions are common in, in these values. Um, um, now, um, um, as far as I'm concerned, humanity has been dehumanized and we, we need to find ways to rehumanize humanity, to go back to these values so that they are the basis of how we live and uh, how we do politics, uh, how, how we do everything in, in life. Um, and uh, whether we create a Senate in the UN, I don't know how to do that. I don't know whether politicians will listen anyway to, 
to uh, a committee of uh, religion that represents all uh, religions. But uh, uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, you know uh, 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 there's a crisis uh, uh, across many countries in the world that uh, uh, manifests in, uh, in loss of these uh, essential values that makes us human be beings, you know, in the, in the first place. And uh, it's becoming uh, such a materialistic world that nothing counts except, you know, uh, reaching the target, whatever that target uh, uh, is. Um, I, I just give a simple example because the speaker was talking about the UN and the Security Council. I may understand um, why there's a uh, the power of veto in the Security Council after World War II uh, for all sorts of political reasons. But I truly don't understand the veto power today. Why one country can, you know, uh, move away the opinion of 200 countries. Uh, something that needs to be uh, reassessed, you know, at the Security Council uh, level. And I'm not talking about the Middle East only, I'm talking about globally. Uh, but there is definitely uh, uh, a crisis of uh, going back to our base, to our values as, as uh, human beings, regardless of what the, because the values are the same for all religions. Um, and, uh, uh, but I'm at a loss of how we can do that. But there, there needs to be a debate on, on, on going on that <coughs> path. Mr. Pion, the floor is yours. Many questions and no, challenge. Um, first, I want to say that we must uh, fight against uh, radicalism and uh, extremism, but with our value. If we fight this uh, uh, radicalism uh, using the same uh, um, method, then we, we will lose uh, the, the, the essential. Uh, the, the second comment is uh, uh, um, uh, about your, uh, your question. Um, what we ask to the Muslim in Europe is exactly what we, ask, we asked to the Christian 200 years ago. Because the Christian had the same uh, um, um, uh, desire to to, to rule the society, and they rule the society during a long, long time. And uh, if, if I um, just uh, refer to the French example, uh, during about uh, uh, 200 years, the French uh, Republic fight against the, the church, and the church fights against uh, the, 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 the Republican government. Uh, I was a uh, I, I lived in a, a small village in the west of France. There, were, uh, th th there is a very famous uh, Benedictine abbey, and each time I visit this abbey, the, the monk uh, um, um, told me uh, that uh, they were, uh, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, expelled, uh, expelled uh, in 1905. Uh, and they spent about uh, 30 or 40 years in exile in 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 UK. Uh, so we, we we just ask the Muslim the same thing we ask to the Christian because after all this uh, um, uh, tension and 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 competition between religious religion and and government, the the, the Christian accept the rules of the um, uh, civil government everywhere in Europe. Even in uh, a country like UK where, because UK normally is a, is a religious country with uh, the, the queen is the head of the, or the, the king, sorry, is the head of the, um, but, but in fact, uh, everybody knows that uh, the religion, the, the, all the religion in, in UK, all the Christian um, religion accept the, the the law of the state, and so it, it's exactly what we we ask to the Muslim. We, we, it's not a Islamophobia to, to to say to the Muslim, you will have to respect our uh, national uh, uh, contract, our uh, um, the the 
the agreement all the European citizens accept to live together. So they have to accept our values. Is, uh, my, my answer is very clear to your question. And um, and the, the, the last comment I want to, to do is, uh, I think the best way, I, I know what is going to, to say, I'm going to say is not very easy, but the best way to fight against this radicalism, this, uh, what, what you call uh, the, these people who lived in Europe and who uh, uh, refuse uh, our rules, and the best way to uh, fight against this radicalism is to participate to the peace in the Middle East. Uh, I, I know that it's not easy to understand because uh, most of our citizens think uh, Middle East is Middle East and <laughs> we have to uh, manage our own uh, um, um, problem. And, but in fact, if, you, uh, if we are not able to participate, for example, to, the, to, to a solution for the Palestinian question, we will have a, uh, um, a sort of uh, um, uh, a crisis in Middle East uh, for uh, years and years, and this crisis fuel the uh, radicalism in Europe. So it's 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 why I think this question of the defense of minorities in Middle East is so important, and to act uh, because I am no more a politician. So uh, to act, uh, I, cr I had created a small association uh, to help Christian in, uh, of the East. So I, we, we, we did at the beginning we wanted to uh, do political, uh, to, to have a political influence. Uh, but in fact, we spent more of our time to send uh, medicine, uh, uh, milk for children in Lebanon, mm -hmm. in Syria, in Iraq, or to finance uh, um, 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 uh, nurse uh, uh, training in, for example, we, f we finance nurse training in uh, um, the plain of Nineveh, because uh, the situation is so uh, terrible that this, is this sort of action we need uh, today. Excellent. So on that note, I would like to ask everyone to please join me in expressing our sincere and most heartfelt gratitude to a very generous and a very brilliant Mr. Francois Filon.